good morning uh, welcome you all to this session of the course so today our topic of discussion uh, as it is shown is axial flow pumps but before coming to this topic we like to discuss about the characteristics of multiple pumps used together or connected together in a system so first we have to know why multiple pumps that means more than one pump is used or, or are used in a particular application when the head developed or the flow rate delivered by a single pump is not sufficient for a particular application a number of pumps that is more than one pumps are used pumps are used either in series or in parallel when it is used in series then the heads are added that means when you require more head than that developed by a single pump we use the pumps in series and where we require more flow than that developed by or delivered by a pump we use pumps in parallel that means in case of pumps connected in parallel the heads uh, the flow rates are added just like this you can see here the pumps in series that if you have number of pumps that is pump 1 it is simply geometrical series in series geometrically connected in series like this pump 3 pump 3 like this that means the discharge from one pump is connected to the inlet to the other pump and so on so therefore you see if we consider the total head developed across this system of multiple pumps so it is sum of the head developed by individual pump similarly when the pumps are connected in parallels for example pump 1 the system is like this pump 2 then pump 3 if they are used in parallel the arrangement is like this the inflow to the pump it means inlet to the pump inlet flow of water is divided into three parts for example if three pumps are connected these are the common shaft so they are not connected this way this is the common shaft so therefore the flow is divided and ultimately the flow meets like this so that the final discharge is the sum of the discharges from all the pumps so this is the final discharge so here you see the q is divided like this in three parts q1 q2 q3 so it automatically meets and gives q so the total flow which is taken up by the system sum of the flow rates through individual pumps now we come to the characteristic of such a system of multiple pumps let us consider the characteristics of pumps in series and let us consider two pumps of identical design that means two identical pumps if you recollect the head q characteristics the centrifugal pump you see the head q characteristics like this this is the we give it by a dotted curve this is the head q characteristics of a single pump now you see if we use another same similar pump in series what will happen the head will become doubled at any given flow rate that means for a given flow the head will be doubled so therefore we can draw the hq characteristics the relationship between head and discharge q for the two pumps connected in series to identical pumps like this so like this so this meets here that means at any flow the heads are added up double that means if this is h1 so this is h1 that means the two such pumps in series are added so at any point the heads are being added doubled the same pump so the this is h1 this is h1 so therefore we can write this is the single pump characteristics single pump characteristics single pump characteristic well and this is the double pump or combined pump characteristics combined the two pumps connected in series combined pump characteristics 
correct and restrict. So, this is there is two pumps in series, two pumps identical pumps here in series, in series. Now, as we know the operating point depends upon the system resistance that means it is decided or determined by the point of intersection between the pump characteristics and the system characteristics. For example, as we have seen earlier that for a single pump that let it be the single pump characteristics, we, if we know the system characteristics, for example, if this be the system characteristics, what is system characteristics? It is nothing but the head discharge system characteristics, head discharge relationship for the system that is the pipelines and valve to which the pump is connected. That means, it is the head loss to the system for a given flow rate. So, if this characteristic curve is drawn, we know that this is the point of intersection, the single pump. That means, with the single pump and with this system characteristic, this is the operating point. In case of multiple or second combined pump, you have two pumps, the operating point will be, this is the operating point, this is the operating point for combined pump system, for combined pump, operating point for combined pumps, whereas this is the operating point for the single pump. So, one interesting thing is that though the characteristic curve for the combined pump when the two single pumps of identical shape, size and design are used, then the heads are summed up. So, head at any flow rate is doubled, but the operating point gives a head which is higher than the operating head when the single pump was in use, but it is not exactly double. So, the head will be increased, but will not be doubled. That depends upon the system characteristics. Well, similarly, we can show, we can draw rather the characteristics for combined pumps in parallel. Let us see the combined pump. The same way we can draw the combined pump. Let us consider this as the single pump HQ characteristic. Now, when the pumps are used in parallel as I have told you earlier, so flow rates are added at a particular head. So, therefore, the combined pump characteristics can be drawn like this. That means, at a given head, the flow rates are simply doubled. That means, if this be the single pump flow rate Q1 for example, so this part will be Q1. That means, for a given head, we can find out the point in the combined pump by adding the flow rate, that means the same flow rate because the identical pumps are used in parallel. So, this Q1, this Q1. So, it will be same for all heads. So, therefore, this is the single pump characteristics as it was shown earlier in case of pumps used in series. Single pump characteristics and this is the combined pump characteristics. Well, combined pump characteristic, characteristic. Well, when the pumps are in parallel, so this is the case that pumps are in parallel. Similarly, here also the operating point is decided by the intersection of the characteristic curves with the system resistance. That means, let this be the system resistance let this be the system resistance that is system characteristics or system resistance as you tell. So, system resistance curve. So, this is the operating point for the combined pump where we see the operating point does not give double the head as shown by the operating point in case of the single pump. So, the head is increased, but is not doubled. So, this is finally the sorry not head the flow rate operating point. So, flow rate is increased, but not double operating point for combined pump. I repeat it again that as we have seen earlier in case of pumps in series, that pumps in parallel. So, the operating point is here. So, the head that is ultimately delivered depends upon the operating point. So, this is increased from that delivered by single pump because single pump operating point is there, but it is not doubled, but characteristic curve itself shows that at any head the uh, this discharge is doubled, but here the discharge is not doubled. Okay. This is the combined 
pumps in parallel when they are identical. In a similar way, in most general cases, we can show, we can show the pumps in series on parallel when they are not identical. That means, pumps are not necessarily to be identical when they are used in series and parallel. So, it is also very simple, same thing. We may have two pumps, let this is one pump, pump 1, characteristics of one pump and let these be the characteristics of another pump, where these characteristics is steep, steeper than the number. So, number this is one pump, these are the two pumps are dissimilar pumps. So, if we use the two in series, it is nothing at one flow rate, we have to add the heads. That means, we will have to start from here. Now, it will come like this and then it will follow the same because here the head is 0. So, the, where the head of the second pump is 0, so it will follow the first pump. So, this is the characteristic for combined pumps for combined pumps in series. Similarly, we can draw for the pumps in parallel. So, up to this part, there is no flow delivered by the pump 1. So, therefore, this will closely follow or totally follow the pump 2, then it will be like this. Because after that, at any head, the flow of the flow rate de delivered by the two pumps will be added. So, it is very simple. So, therefore, it is for characteristic for characteristic for combined pumps in parallel, for combined pumps in parallel. So, therefore, we see that the characteristics of multiple pumps whether parallel, whether they are used in series or parallel can be drawn in this way by adding the heads at a given flow rate for pumps in series or by adding the flow rates for all the individual pumps at a given head when the pumps are connected in parallel. And the operating point will determine entirely by the, for example, this will be the operating point if the system resistance is this for the combined pump in parallel and this is for the combined pump in series under this system operating characteristic. It will determine by the intersection of the system characteristics or system resistance with the characteristics of the combined pump system. Well, so now we have completed uh, this section of centrifugal pump. Now we will come to axial flow pump. Now, a, an axial flow pump is a pump where the flow of liquid, that is the water, is in the axial direction. That means the flow is in the direction of the axis of rotation. Well, you have seen that in centrifugal pump, the flow is in the radial direction. It is a radial flow pump and the flow is radially outward. As you know, for a pump, the for a radial flow pump, the flow has to be radially outward. This is because to gain pressure, to gain pressure energy of the fluid from the centrifugal energy, so that the fluid has to go outward, so that at the outlet, the centrifugal head is more than that at the inlet. So, therefore, we see that centrifugal pump is a radial flow pump. So, axial flow pump is a pump where the flow is almost in the axial direction. That means, the inlet and outlet of the fluid do not vary in their radial location from the axis of rotations. We have discussed this in axial flow turbine also. This is the definition holds good as well for any axial flow machine. So, therefore, an axial flow pump can be thought of as an converse to an axial flow turbine or a propeller turbine. And we can just have a look what how an axial flow pump looks like. So, you see basically the axial flow um, pump uh, consists of a central boss on which a number of blades or vanes are mounted. This is basically the impeller and this impeller rotates within a cylindrical casing. This is the cylindrical casing with fine clearance. This is these are the clearance. So, therefore, this boss with the number of blades mounted on it consists the impeller. This is rotated in the cylindrical casing. So, these are the inlet. 
So, therefore, you see this is the impeller, this is the impeller, this is this you cannot so see clearly impeller. So, this is this one, I write it here stationary, stationary guide vanes. The purpose of the stationary guide vanes is to direct the fluid in the correct way to this impeller blades, so that they can enter the impeller blade without any shock. The most important part of an axial flow machine is this stationary blades, stationary outlet guide fence. This is stationary outlet, which is not there outlet guide fence in a radial flow machine. The purpose of the stationary outlet guide vanes is not to convert any energy from kinetic energy to pressure energy. It simply changes the direction of motion. That means it reduces the whirling component of velocity which the fluid possess, the water possess from the outlet or at the outlet of the impeller. So, this whirling component is reduced so that it is directed in such a way, the fluid is directed in such a way while it passes through this stationary outlet guide vein, so that the final discharge from the machine becomes almost axial, that means in the direction parallel to the axis of rotation. This is the axis of rotation, this is the rotation omega, this is rotating like this. So, this is in general a schematic view of an axial flow pump. Let us see the velocity diagram of an axial flow pump. Now, if we take a section of the blade like this, if we see a section of the blades, then the it looks like this that this is the well this is the blade impeller blade one impeller blade and this is the outlet guide vein. So, this is the impeller blade impeller blade one impeller blade, the section is made like this. If we take a section like this, we will see this. This is the inlet guide vane, this is the impeller, glide, uh, impeller blade and this is the outlet guide vane. So, we are seeing the impeller blade and the outlet guide vane. So, this is the outlet guide vane. Now, usually what happens is that the inlet guide vanes directs the water in such a way as you know earlier cases also that it glides. That means, it strikes smoothly with this, that means this is the tangential direction. So, that the angle made by the relative velocity that is the in this direction the blade is moving that is the u 1. So, this makes the same angle with that the blade at the inlet. So, therefore, this is the velocity triangle at the inlet, this is the absolute velocity at the inlet and this is the whirling component or the blade velocity. This is the blade velocity, rather I will tell this is the blade velocity. Okay. Now, another thing is very important, the inlet and outlet of the fluid rather you see here takes place in such a way that the, the, the inlet and outlet do not vary in the radial location from the axis of rotation. So, therefore, the velocity triangle is shown at a mean height, so that inlet and outlet which is varying with their axial location, not in the radial location. So, this is this diagram is made at the mean height of the uh, pump, that means at a mean radius, at a mean radius, that means this is the axis of rotation. So, the radius varies from this place, this is the half radius, that is the root of the impeller blade, and this is the tip radius. So, this is made at the mean radius, and all the velocities are therefore considered to be mean if there is any variation along the radial direction. So, therefore, we consider this as the mean velocity or some average velocity in the average velocity where if there is any variation in the radial direction. So, therefore, we see the outlet diagram here now when it comes out this is the absolute velocity coming out from the impeller blade, this is the relative velocity. So, which is gliding out of the blade and we see this is the blade velocity at the outlet and since the inlet and outlet at the same radial location, so u 2 is equal to u 1, u 1 is equal to u 2. So, therefore, we see this is the v w 2, 
V dub, sorry, V w one the holding component of velocity at the inlet and similarly this part is the whirling component of velocity at the outlet. And this is the axial velocity because this is the axial direction V a 1 and V a 2 at the outlet. And the design is made in such a way that V a 1 is V a 2. Now, we can write that the energy imparted to the fluid in the impeller blade per unit mass can be written as from our earlier discussion as written as V w 1 u 1 minus V w 2 u 2 rather this is with a negative sign with a negative sign with a negative sign because this is more than this or we can write is equal to this is the energy imparted to the fluid if we tell V w 1 times the u 1 or u 2 simply we write u 1 is equal to u 2 is equal to. So, this is the amount of energy imparted to the fluid per unit mass. So, mass flow rate m dot can be expressed as the density times the average axial velocity which is known as the flow velocity is either V a 1 or V a 2 they are same in the design times the area that is pi r t square minus r h square where r t is the root diameter and root radius rather r h is the half radius. That means, if you see that, that this is the root, uh, root radius and this is the tip radius. So, this is the half radius, this is the tip radius, root or half that is the half radius that is the tip radius. So, impeller tip. So, this is the tip radius and this is the root or half radius. So, this is the average axial velocity or flow velocity. So, this way we can find out the mass flow rate which when multiplied with that will give the power that is being transferred to the fluid when it passes through the impeller blade. Now, this is the outlet guide vane as I have told you earlier the purpose of this outlet guide vane is to reduce the whirling component of velocity here you see at the inlet to this blade is the velocity V 2 which is the absolute velocity from the moving impeller blade and it has got a whirling component of velocity of this much. So, this is being reduced that depends upon the shape of the blade. So, that at the outlet the fluid which is coming out with the velocity V 3 which is the discharge velocity where the whirling component is almost reduced. So, this velocity is almost axial this component is reduced. So, you understand very well this component is reduced. So, velocity is almost axial. So, this alpha 3 represents the angle with the axis which is almost 0. So, it is almost an axial discharge. Here alpha 2 represents the angle of the absolute velocity that makes with the tangential direction, the direction of blade motion. Similarly, this is alpha 1 in the inlet velocity triangles. This is beta 1 that is the velocity of relative velocity, angle of the relative velocity with the tangential direction. Similarly, this is beta 2. So, beta 1 and beta 2 are the blade inlet and outlet angles for a smooth shockless flow. Well, so this is the blade diagram and we can find out the energy uh, or power imparted to the fluid in, a, in the impeller blade of an axial uh, pump. Now, obviously, as you know in case of an axial flow machine for axial flow turbine, the specific speed in case of an axial flow turbine was more. That means, axial flow machines, uh, the head developed will be less and the flow is more. Similar the case in similar the case is with axial flow pump. So, in axial flow pump the head developments are relatively lower or smaller rather the flow rate or flow delivered is higher as compared to a centrifugal pump. Centrifugal pump develops more head but a low flow whereas, an axial flow pump develops low head but more flow. In other words, the Specific speed, as you know the specific speed, the definition specific speed of pump, if you recall the specific speed of pump, dimensional specific speed n q to the power half h to the power 3 by 4. So, specific speed for an axial flow pump is high, that means it compared to that of a centrifugal pump, that means it handles more flow, but at a lower head relative to a centrifugal pump. Well, now after this, I will um, uh, solve an interesting example before closing this lecture. Please see that example. 
uh, we will solve this problem. It is a very interesting problem. Calculate the least diameter of a centrifugal pump to just start delivering water to a height of 30 meter. If the inside diameter of impeller is half of the outside diameter and the manometric efficiency is 0.8, the pump runs at 1000 rpm. Again I am reading, calculate the least diameter of a centrifugal pump. We have to find out the least diameter of a centrifugal pump to just start delivering water to a height of 30 meter. This is the static head of the pump. And the other condition is that the inside diameter of impeller is half the outside diameter and the manometric efficiency is 0.8. The pump runs at 1000 rpm. Okay. Achha, well, just before this problem, I like to inform you another data which I have forgotten to tell you, just I have uh, remembered here, if you please excuse me, that you must know this, that number of impeller blades in an axial flow turbine usually lies between 2 to 8, the number of veins, number of blades, number of blades, impeller blades, number of here impeller blades. And the ratio of the half to tip radius, that means R H R T varies between 0.3 to 0.6. These two are very important design information. Well, so now again coming back to the example of this problem, example problem, the pump runs at 1000 rpm. That means if a pump has to start to lift a water to a head of 30 meter, the pump cannot start without a minimum diameter, calculate the minimum diameter, that means the impeller diameter, we will have to calculate if the pump runs, if the RPM is fixed, so pump diameter has to be, there is has to be a minimum diameter below which the pump cannot start working, that means this lift of 30 meter is not possible. So how to solve this problem? Now as you know, if you recollect that the head developed by the pump to the fluid in case of a pump, that head developed by the pump to the fluid is given by V1, that is head means energy developed per unit weight, the energy per unit weight to be given to the fluid can be written as V2 square minus V1 square by 2G, if you recollect, plus U2 square minus U1 square by 2G plus VR1 square minus V. So for any turbo machine, this is the total energy transfer between the machine and the fluid. For a pump, this is the energy per unit weight, that is the head energy per unit weight that has to be developed by the pump or that is being imparted by the pump to the fluid. Now as you know, if you can recall, this is the kinetic head or kinetic energy, this is the kinetic head developed or imparted to the fluid and this part is the pressure head, pressure head. So, this part of the pressure head is due to the change in the centrifugal head because the fluid is displaced in its position in a centrifugal force field from one radial location to other radial location that is U2 is the final one that is the outlet U2 square minus U1 square by 2G, U2 is always more than U1 because the flow is radially outward and this one is the change in the relative velocity. Usually in a pump, the relative velocity Vr at 1 at the inlet is more than that at the outlet. So therefore, the relative velocity of the liquid while flowing through the pump impeller is reduced. So because of this reduction in the relative velocity, there is an increase in the pressure. So this part is the gain in the pressure energy because of a reduction in the relative velocity. According to Bernoulli's theorem, there is a gain in the pressure energy. So these two part combinedly gives the pressure rate. Now when a pump just starts working, then at that moment we can neglect these two parts because the velocity has not yet been established. So at the start, at the onset of the start, the pump has to develop only this centrifugal head. So therefore, in this problem, we will equate that the pump dimension should be such and its rotational speed should be such that at the start, the centrifugal head is the only head that is being developed while these two terms are 0. That must be sufficient one to overcome the friction and the static lift. That means this must be equal to the 
static lift H s divided by the manometric efficiency. This is very important thing. So, in our problem, so if we do so, we see that u 2 square minus u 1 square by 2 g according to the problem, it is given that 30 meter is the static lift divided by point t. Now, according to the problem, the impeller diameter, inner diameter is half of the outer diameter. That means, you can write that u 2 by u 1 is d 2 by d 1 diameter, where d 2 is the impeller diameter or the outside diameter of the impeller blade and d 1 is the inside diameter of the impeller blade. So, d 2 by d 1 is 2 given. So, u 2 by u 1 is 2, u 2 is the velocity blade velocity, impeller blade velocity at the outlet, impeller blade velocity at the inlet. So, therefore, we can write u 1 is half u 2. So, if you substitute this, then we get u 2 square minus half u 2 whole square divided by 2 g, very simple 30 0 0.8, which from which you get 3 by 8 one fourth one minus g u 2 square is 30 by 0 0.8, which gives u 2 is equal to root over 8 into g is 9.81 into 30 divided by 3 into 0 0.8 under root, which will be if you calculate 31.32 meter per second. Now, if we use this, then we can find out the diameter. We know that relationship between rotational speed with the linear speed is like that, where n is expressed in revolution per minute, so by 60 per second pi d 2. So, this becomes u 2. Here, if you use this pi into d 2 into revolution n r in rpm, it is given 1000 in the problem. Now, next part is simple u 2, which is equal to 31.3 rest part is simple which gives d 2 is 0 0.6 meter. So, this is a very interesting problem that a pump therefore, this is the most interesting information is this. So, therefore, for a pump of given dimensions, there should be a minimum rotational speed for pump to start against a static lift with a manometric efficiency or for a given rotational speed, the pump must have a minimum diameter impeller diameter for it to start. Well, so today I think uh, this is all, uh, all right, we have completed the axial flow pump and we have solved one interesting problem today. Next class we will start the reciprocating pump, okay, thank you.